Hello, this is Andrew Al from Digital Charlotte, and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast. Today, we'll be listening to the Di- National Digital Inclusion Alliances, also known as the NDIA's Net Inclusion Webinar Series. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance Net Inclusion Conference has been a staple in the digital inclusion community for years, bringing hundreds of practitioners, advocates, academics, internet service providers, and policymakers together to share their knowledge. With social distancing in place, the NDIA is hosting the Net Inclusion 2020 webinar series to replace the conference. This series includes eight one-hour webinars recorded live from September 16th through November 4th. You can find the full schedule, recordings, and resources at digitalinclusion.org slash net inclusion 2020 webinar series. The link to this will be in the description. Today's webinar topic is local government digital equity strategies. First recorded on October 7th, 2020. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to the uh, next in our series, the fourth in our series of net inclusion uh, webinars, our replacement to our annual in-person conference. Uh, So I'm very excited today to be able to bring you a session that is focused on local governments. When we first started NDIA, we thought mostly our membership base would be community-based organizations, libraries, a schooler there. There's no schools, but guess who showed up at our party? Local governments. And uh, we used to joke when it first started happening, like, ah, who invited the local governments in? (laughs) We were thrilled to have local governments involved, but we really didn't know that they were so active in the solution. And they were, which is awesome. So um, here we go. This uh, this webinar series is what NDIA is providing uh, to our affiliates and our community and to anyone who would like to join us. Uh, they are recorded. They are all on our website. We very much want these to be valuable to you to do things in your community, right? So um, the question and answer will be open. Use the Q&A for, for those. Uh, we do... Um, we, we do watch those. We will respond to those during this session. The way we structure it is that the first hour is where we get into the anything we might consider like super meaty and we don't want to make sure that we miss. And then we save the last 30 minutes, which is kind of like your bonus 30 minutes, as more Q&A. So we will get to some of the Q&A during the first hour and then we will get to more Q&A in the bonus 30 minutes. If you have to leave us after an hour, know that you've gotten a good chunk of it and that's why we structure it that way because not everybody can set aside an hour and a half Uh, but it will be on the website as the other previous webs webinars are we were joking with these amazing panelists that the last panel really rocked it so they all know the bar is really high (laughs) no pressure team Alrighty, we're three minutes after so i think it's solid for us to get started now Um, i'm so pleased to introduce you to this all female rock star panel that we have today. Don't tell the men, but I love the all female panels. So we have uh, Candelaria from San Antonio. I'm just gonna go around one by one and you can all be like, here's the basics of what I do. One minute, Candelaria. Hi, yeah, I'm Candelaria Mendoza. I am one of two smart city coordinators for the city of San Antonio. I actually, started with uh, digital inclusion as one of my key uh, priority projects. So uh, that's one of the main things that's taking up most of my time right now. Which is amazing. Uh, Lauren, Chicago. Hello, I'm Lauren Burdett. I'm the Senior Equity Manager in Mayor Lightfoot's office in the new Office of Equity and Racial Justice. And uh, I am actually new to the digital inclusion space. Uh, The COVID uh, crisis actually sort of uh, expedited our interest. And so it has become one of my primary responsibilities though. Excited to be here. And we have two Rebecca's today. I'll always be super careful to say last names. Rebecca Kama. Thank you so much, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Los Angeles, California. My name is Rebecca Kawuma, and my pronouns are she, hers, and hers. I am the Economic and Digital Inclusion Program Manager here for the City of Long Beach, and I manage the city's economic and digital inclusion initiatives, and I'm very much passionate about racial equity and uplifting communities of color and low-income communities, so I'm excited to be able to share more about what we've been working on here in Long Beach and to learn from my esteemed colleagues. Thank you. Fabulous, thank you. Rebecca Gibbons. 
Hello, good morning, everybody. Rebecca Gibbons, she, her. I'm with the city of Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm the broadband and digital equity program manager, and um, I'm primarily tasked with implementing the city's broadband and digital, uh, I'm sorry, the digital equity action plan and uh, leading our digital inclusion network in partnership with Multnomah County and Multnomah County Library. Super, thank you. Uh, so why were these four ladies invited? One of the projects NDIA started when we realized that local governments were jumping into the solutions and were so essential to this work uh, is what we're calling, what we've been calling our Trailblazers Initiative. So on our website is a, a whole section about who the trailblazers are and the indicators we use to determine who are the local governments that are doing amazing digital inclusion work. Three of these ladies are from cities that are digital inclusion trailblazers and Lauren is here because Chicago is just rocking it right now around digital inclusion. So we have this fabulous breadth of experience today. We're going to start with the fact that cities don't do work in vacuums. Like none of you are sitting by yourselves. Okay, you might be sitting by yourself, but you are, <laughs> that was a terrible way to phrase that. Uh, you are not um, doing this work alone. You are working with your community partners, which is how we see so much digital inclusion work progress. Uh, so let's get into some of those examples. Uh, Rebecca Gibbons, you all, um, I think you have the oldest digital inclusion network, I would say of our four folks here. Uh, tell us about how how long has DIN been around? Uh, Portland folks really do call it DIN, which I think is delightful. Uh, and how, what's the relationship between DIN and the city? Sure, yeah, well, well first the, the DIN um, was really instrumental in helping us um, get our plan in place to begin with. Um, when we started down this path, uh, the city had a broadband strategic plan that identified some digital equity issues um, we also had some kind of local data sets about who was impacted by the digital uh, divide and some of the barriers they were facing. Um, but it wasn't until we convened these community conversations um, with leaders in our community. And these were, you know, from government agencies, nonprofits, schools, libraries, um, and even um, workforce development and healthcare providers. Um, that we really got the attention of our elected officials and started to make pro progress towards um, defining issues and developing strategies. And that started back in 2014. Um, and we were really fortunate that once uh, the adoption of the plan in 2016, that our DIN members remained involved. So they, they participated in, in work group sessions and planning sessions to actually write the plan. Um, and then once it was adopted, they, they remained with us. So they, we meet monthly. Um, we have continued conversations about work we're doing under the plan. We use the plan as a framework for the strategies that we're imp implementing. And you know, they use those DIN meetings that we have monthly to um, come together, meet new people, find out what's happening in the community. Um, it's really great to see the collaborations and. The, the ideas happening at the DIN meetings, but they often go off on their own afterwards and have these detailed conversations and get projects off the ground and then they come back to the DIN meetings to report out. Um, so it's been really essential that we have that time and place to come together. Um, most of our DIN members are, you know, doing some digital equity in some form or fashion. Um, they are providing direct services in terms of digital literacy training, or they're coming to the DIN meetings because they want to learn more about what the barriers are and what the needs are and, and maybe look for partners, or they're leading um, advocacy discussions. And it's because of this broad cross-section of organizations that are coming together that we continue to see momentum and interest. Um, Super. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go to Candelaria? Candelaria, I like to tell folks, I say it a lot actually, San Antonio has somebody on city staff that really was involved with the creation of their, uh, their network, which you all have a fabulous name for, DIASA, Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio. So how do you think your knowledge of the digital inclusion ecosystem that was out there has impacted the city's work? Yeah, I think it was actually very instrumental. Um, we definitely give a lot of credit to uh, the Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio 
for socializing the issue. Um, I mean, just to think about Rebecca and having their plan, we're hoping to get there one day, but um, a lot of it was just about engaging the community, our leadership, letting them know about the digital divide. What does it mean? How does it impact them? And so kind of being involved in that conversation expanded my knowledge and I was able to kind of bring that into um, the smart city partnership in, in the Office of Innovation at the city of San Antonio. Uh, we very much believe that in order for us to be a smart city, we need to be tackling the digital divide. We can't be a smart city if 20% of our population doesn't have um, access to the internet from their home. So uh, that's just at a, a top priority for us. I can't tell you how exciting it is to hear someone in a local government say that and actually be following it up with action. Right. Too often we hear, oh, yes, <laughs> it's important for everybody to have to have access when they're talking about smart cities, but then they don't actually do anything with it. And San Antonio is. Uh, tell me about how you think um, your established digital inclusion ecosystem in San Antonio has aided your work both before and during COVID. So yeah, I mean, the city of Ten San Antonio has definitely put their money where their mouth is. Um, we worked with the Alliance uh, to kind of set up a path for us and set it up in, in phases. So before COVID, we were already working on a digital inclusion survey and assessment. So we just wanted more localized data. How is the digital divide impacting San Antonio? So we worked with our local uh, university, the University of um, San Antonio, and uh, we also worked with the Alliance and other members uh, to, to shape it and, and pick out the questions that were going to be very important for us to have data around. So we went out, we deployed the survey, we got over 6,000 um, responses back. We did a huge outreach and of course it was pre-COVID so we got to do a lot of face-to-face. -face. We did a lot of outreach. It was in English and in Spanish uh, and a link later you'll have access to some of that information and copies of our survey and what questions we asked. So we did all of that before COVID hit. Uh, we wrapped it up around February and then UTSA was able to pull it together and create an assessment um, to really capture that map of who is and isn't connected to the internet and of course um, as our theories uh, had it, uh, education and income and all of that had a, had a play on it. So we were able to capture that information and actually use it. And I think it definitely uh, gave us an advantage because during COVID as council was trying to decide where should we put these CARES Act dollars, we were able to submit a $27 million proposal around supporting digital inclusion for students to kind of help with that distance learning, that homework gap, and it got approved. So uh, we are now in the in the thick of working with the school districts, working with our partners, um, trying to figure out what all that puzzle piece looks like to make sure that we're doing research, uh, that it's a good customer experience, that we're meeting bandwidth needs. Um, so that's, um, we definitely feel that our ecosystem and that momentum that we already had established before COVID allowed us this opportunity to, to make sure that the, that proposal was looked at in, in good faith and got approval from all of our city council. There are lots of us talking about that proposal, lots of us talking about how you all are planning to build a solution to an affordability problem. We used to think of building broadband to address lack of availability, but you and we're seeing other communities also building in order to address the affordability gap. That's more of a long-term play. What we're seeing in Chicago is more short-term solution now. Um, so shut. Lauren, let's dig into what Chicago's doing. Uh, NDIA has been fascinated and thrilled with um, the process that you all have developed. Uh, we were particularly humbled to learn that our digital inclusion startup manual was referenced and considered when the money was all allocated for community-based organizations. Uh, so tell us about the role that those community-based organizations are playing in your um, sponsored agreement agreements initiatives? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think similar to Candelaria and Rebecca, we uh, partnership has been sort of core to Chicago connected from the beginning. The entire idea um, for the program came from parents, CPS parents, our public school parents who um, indicated internet as an essential 
need uh, in their communities and a report that was published by Kids for Chicago showing that one in five kids in Chicago lack access to the internet and that that gap widens when you look at some of our most underinvested neighborhoods like Austin and West Englewood. So, you know, I think that um, access, even though you're in a large urban city, is, is a huge gap still. So we um, purposely designed the program, uh, which is four years, $50 million initiative to provide 100,000 Chicago public school kids uh, and their families uh, with internet access. And uh, it's only made possible by our really generous funders and our $5 million in, of CARES Act money um, in the last two years are paid for by the public school system. But we are, um, you can see sort of through this that like the 35 community-based organizations are really key to sort of establishing trust. So they were part of the design from the beginning. There was a selection process. So there's an applica open application for community groups to apply to be part of the program. Community groups have two primary responsibilities. One is doing outreach and sort of proving to families this is a, a real thing. This isn't too good to be true, uh, which is actually a huge barrier we faced. A lot of families get the code in the mail, they hear about it, and they're like, yeah, the, there's probably some secret charge that we aren't being told about. And so CBOs have been essential to getting families to know that it's real and sign up. And then the second responsibility they have is the digital literacy training. And so, you know, I think NDIA helped us understand that the digital literacy skills and um, support for the adults in the household are as important as the actual connection itself. And so um, they've been really key to that. And that part of the program is, is gearing up now. Um, the other thing that is kind of exciting, we're, we're starting a partnership with our city colleges system to think about what are some other ways to help the adults in the household kind of capitalize on those digital literacy skills they'll be gaining uh, to help them in the workplace. Super, thank you, Lauren. The involvement of the community in the solutions and in defining what it, the problems are. Uh, Rebecca, comma, you have like been at the forefront of, we have to hear from the community. So tell us um, first, if you would define for us collective impact approach, and then let's talk about what that means when, you know, functionally. Sure, thank you so much, Angela. Um, when I first heard about the collective impact approach, I actually heard about it first from a colleague. So it was my colleague that worked in the health department and they were using that approach to be able to advance um, different strategies for older adults, and I was very much blown away by it. But for those of you guys who are not familiar with collective impact, it is an approach for us to be able to collaborate across different sectors and to be able to work together and solve a problem. And the re reason why I really like collective impact is first and foremost, it shares the act of responsibility on everyone. So I would say oftentimes when we're looking at the digital divide, people may say, oh, it's the responsibility of local government, of libraries, of different organizations, but we see collective impact as an opportunity for us to be able to come together collectively to be able to solve an issue. And collective impact also uplifts a lot of different principles that are very key to the work that we do here. So it does put a priority on equity. So the effort intentionally um, focuses on addressing systemic and institutional barriers that are creating the different digital inequities and also ensuring that we're including community members as part of our effort as well. So those who have been disproportionately affected by the digital divide have a seat at the decision making table. So for us here in Long Beach, we have been applying that effort to our work. So as part of our digital inclusion stakeholder committee, we are convening a committee and these committees consist of different organizations. So everything from members of the community to also our public libraries, to city departments, to private technology companies, community-based organizations, educational institutions, ISPs, and we're all coming together to be able to help advance digital equity and inclusion. And one of the things that we were trying to be very intentional about with our collective impact approach is ensuring that we have community representation. So for us, we worked closely with our community-based organizations to identify a community representative who can provide us with that unique perspective and also share their lived experiences. And we also compensated them for um, their time. So ensuring that we're uplifting the voices of community members who are most affected by the digital divide is very much a priority for us. That's awesome. Thank you. Rebecca Gibbons, we are seeing right now this incredible 
interest by folks who've never done digital inclusion work to be like, I'll help, I'll help, let me do something to work on this, uh, which we all appreciate, of course. Uh, but when that has happened in Portland, how have you all responded to that? Yeah, we, you know, before uh, COVID, it was our DIN members who were bringing those messages to the community and to council. Um, post COVID, you know, we're hearing a lot of, of stories from residents themselves, kind of like what Rebecca was saying. Um, we follow that collective impact model and we look to engage our communities. And um, what, when we were trying to get those voices to the table pre COVID, you know, we were having to bring them. Those voices are out there now. You're hearing those voices from the thousands of students who are not you know, connected and, and going to school. Um, you're hearing about seniors and people with disabilities and those facing isolation who um, aren't getting healthcare or important public safety information. So a lot of that, um, those stories are kind of driving that conversation and so We've had a lot of interest from folks, kind of, you know, our public safety folks who and our COVID response, um, emergency response teams are, are coming to us and saying, hey, we're hearing directly from residents, you know, how services are not getting delivered. Um, so we're doing um, a lot about uh, having conversations and working with folks to educate them about what we've been doing in the past, the resources that we have, um, some of the needs we have, some of the best practices. Um, and, and while we have like a really rich um, community support for the issue, I think one of the things that we've seen kind of um, in addition to the increase of interest is an acknowledgement about the lack of funding that we've had in the past around doing this work. Um, and, and because of COVID, we've seen an increase in that. We've, we've adjusted and used a little bit of our, our uh, city budget to address that initially. We had a small corporate donation and now we have CARES Act funds. Oh, Angela, you're muted. Wow, oh, you see, even though I do this constantly. Uh, Rebecca Kama, you have an incredible in-depth understanding of what it means to be inclusive and how we reach for true digital equity. To those who are striving towards these goals, and I know you could give us lots and lots of advice, so I'm gonna ask you to just like bring it down to two points. What are two like, okay, if you're gonna do anything, think about these two things. Sure, so the first thing that I wanna mention is it's important for you to have an understanding of how you first and foremost define equity. So for us here in the city of Long Beach, we define equity as everyone having the opportunity to attain the highest level of health and potential for a successful life, regardless of their background and, and um, identity. So oftentimes when we hear equity, we hear um, the difference between equality and equity, but it's very important for us to be able to focus on fairness and how we are uplifting communities most in need. So that is one of the first things that I wanna mention is that anytime you're designing a digital inclusion strategy or you know, working closely to be able to implement a new program to be able to address the digital divide, have you looked to see what communities are most in need? And one of the greatest ways to be able to do that is to disaggregate data. So oftentimes when we look at data, it may be aggregated. So it may tell you, you know, X amount of people are affected by the digital divide, but how does that look like when you disaggregate it by um, data and when you do that with race, zip code, age? So intentionally looking to see at which groups are disproportionately affected by digital divide and uplifting that in your various efforts. And also last point that I wanna make is focusing on systems change efforts. So um, it's good for us to be able to have programmatic solutions and strategies, but unless we're looking at systems change efforts, we are not going to be able to get to the root causes of why those digital inequities exist. And um, one great resource that I wanna share with you all that will be posted in the chat is the water of systems change. This is a great resource to be able to understand what systems change truly means in practice, because I see that term being thrown around quite often and not always people may understand fully what that looks like in practice, but being able to advance racial equity and digital inclusion through system change includes us looking at our policies, practices, resources, and also um, power dynamics as well. So all of these are key essential components on being able to advance digital equity. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Candelaria, City of San Antonio has established an Office of Equity. How have they been involved in your work? 
So similar to Rebecca's point, um, we've definitely have spent some time kind of socializing how equity works within city government. Um, again, to her point of moving from equality to fairness. So city council kind of took it on as a, a kind of phases and that we, um, they used it first for the capital improvements project of, you know, we already know that there's some sidewalks at, or some parts of the city that need more attention to sidewalks and streets. So they started giving uh, that piece of, of equity to kind of bring them up to speed with other parts of the city. And then we, we brought that uh, same conversation to the budget. So we've been incorporating conversations of equity to the budget conversation these last three years now. And so um, now the office has been pretty good, pretty well established and we've been working very closely with them to have conversations with them about how we incorporate um, equity in our projects when it comes to the digital divide. Um, one of the main things that we did was use it for when we were doing our uh, proposal for the city around the $27 million connected beyond the classroom. We were able to use, and I believe there'll be a link um, for y'all to see it, but we have the city uh, pulled together through the office equity atlas maps. So again, it kind of pulls to that, where do you need the most resources? Where are the people that are most disconnected? And we kind of overlaid that information with the findings of our, our survey to be able to identify the 50 priority neighborhoods that we're working with within our project. So again, we wanted to make sure that council understood why we were gonna be working in certain areas of town before we got to their district. Again, this is not a, each of your districts get this much or this much or this much. It was definitely gonna be of, we're gonna start where the people are most disconnected and then move beyond that and expand it if we can. So one of the other pieces that we did to keep the conversation around equity is create digital inclusion report cards that are also gonna be included in that link with the report. And again, this is just kind of very high level visual um, aspect to council looking at their district and seeing where they fall when it comes to the three legs of the stool. So it has a grade for them in digital literacy, it has a grade for them in connectivity, and it has a grade for them in devices. So because of the survey, we were able to kind of capture that on a district level. So each of our districts have a report card and it basically shows that disparity and that our districts one through five, um, their percentages of access to internet devices and literacy we're far uh, worse off than our newer districts in six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So again, very high level way for them to see something easy grades, right? We all understand when we're, when we're passing or failing. Um, so they get to see if they're getting an A, we're probably not gonna spend resources on you right now. If you're getting a C or a D, then that's where we're gonna go first. I am totally uh, thrilled with this development and not just like what's happening in your cities, but we're kind of seeing that happen in multiple places where it's in the past when we would talk about broadband, the, the conversation was so focused on availability of the infrastructure that we were not addressing the fact that there are folks who aren't accessing it because it's not affordable or for other reasons. And so because we were only focusing on availability, there were no equity discussions in that. That's that's the right. It was that was more um, build it, and it's up to them if they want to participate or not. If it's too expensive, yeah. Well, that's like we are, and those of us who've been in this field have been talking about that, have been thinking, thinking about that. But the change right now is that we're seeing that more widespread. It's not just a few of us talking like that, right? And the fact that you all are getting the support that you are within your cities to to think of it through the, the equity lens is so incredibly <laughs> exciting, right? Um, I know there's a lot of work and we will make sure to temper any of my excitement, but I do feel like we're on a really solid path that we haven't been on before. So let me go to Rebecca Gibbons to talk about Portland. So you all adopted a racial equity goal back in 2015. And we know that that goal and the work towards that goal has affected your digital equity work. So tell us how that works. Yeah, having some digital equity or having some racial equity goals at the city level really helped us understand how our strategies and our focus around broadband access for all really needed to prioritize, you know, our services and solutions by centering our communities of color. Um, like, like Long Beach and we look to Long Beach and um, San Antonio and others um, to see what they're doing around it. 
but uh, you know, race is a defining characteristic. Um, so our D prioritizes. So when, when we adopted this initial plan, it does prioritize um, people of color, people with disabilities and seniors. Um, so we limited it to those communities. Um, and the plan that we're looking to do now, we're embarking on our next phase of the digital equity action plan, so that we're calling it the DEEP 2.0. Um, we are looking to um, things like the regional COVID um, data dashboard that this, the county put together, which um, provides those um, racial and economic indicators that show that people of color are disproportionately affected. Um, and, you know, we're using that similar to what the other cities are talking about. Um, the city of, of Portland also adopted a response values framework based on that indicators dashboard. Um, and so we're really trying to look at how data about racial inequities can help us going forward. Um, we are partnering, you know, one of our government agencies, we're in this partnership with Multnomah County and Multnomah County Library. Well, the county is developing or looking to develop a dashboard similar to this with racial equity indicators that we're going to be able to overlay our, um, our digital inclusion strategies and efforts similar to what San Antonio is doing. We're not as far along in the process, but um, we like that idea of being able to track and have a, a dashboard that um, encourages community conversation, that ongoing community conversation about where resources are going and whether they're not being effective and using it so that we have that iterative discussion and we can shift gears and make sure that what we're doing is working. Awesome, thank you. Rebecca Kalma, you have mentioned in our previous conversations that you use the Portland Plain Plan. Uh, what parts of it stand out as particularly useful? Sure. One of the first things that I do want to mention and uplift is just the wonderful community that NDIA has. So when I was first, you know, joining that digital inclusion space, one of the initial things that I started doing was hosting informational interviews to learn more about the different cities that already have started digital inclusion efforts. And um, my colleague Rebecca was very gracious enough to meet with me. And I really love how organized and thoughtful their plan is, especially for implementation. One of the biggest things that's very hard for us to be able to focus on is developing a plan and then moving that into practice and being able to fully implement all of our efforts. And I was able to instantly learn from um, the city of Portland how to best define the roles and responsibilities of lead partners and supporting partners. And this is something that we've been able to apply to our COVID-19 digital inclusion response working group. So the city of Long Beach in response to the pandemic developed this working group to be able to advance some key digital inclusion efforts that will be able to support individuals during the pandemic. And we wanted to really set aside some different strategies that can be implemented, but also have a structure um, to be able to shape what that looks like for people who are going to lead the strategies and people who are going to support the strategies. So per my conversation with Rebecca from the city of Portland and looking at their documents, I was able to take a lot of their principles that they have for being able to foster collaboration and apply that to the work that we're doing here. So I'm very um, excited for all of the great work that we're doing in Long Beach and also very thankful to that great resource and conversation that she was able to provide me. Fabulous. Uh, Rebecca Gibbons, back to the amazingness in Portland. Uh, how are you articulating and extending the conversation about institutional systemic barriers to equity? Yeah, well, we, you know, with, with COVID and the racial justice movement at the forefront, we are um, still recognizing as much as we had accomplished and um, had set in place back in 2016 that we still have a lot more room to improve. Um, we hired a consultant last year um, to help us with our next phase of our digital equity action plan. And our intention there was that we would really just go through that, you know, collective community engagement process and come at, at our next phase plan. Um, what we've realized now because of these community conversations that are happening and the social distancing um, and the elevated awareness is that we really need to take a step back. And so 
Um, I would say that I'm learning just as much from Rebecca in Long Beach um, as she might have learned from me in the past about where to go going forward. Um, so we are looking to work with our consultants to start having those conversations about, um, you know, leading with race and uh, shifting how we've done things in the past, those systemic and institutional processes that um, may have created unintentionally or intentionally um, barriers and looking at uh, restructuring how we're doing that going forward. Um, I think our, our next phase plan will still have some clear strategies and lead partners and, and, partner and community partners that are then supporting the efforts. But we're also looking to um, shift and reprioritize how we're, how we're leading our digital inclusion network. We see that as one area where we can start to really um, share leadership and bring that community conversation back to the table. So we're looking at ways, and Rebecca's been really helpful in this area for me too, about, um, you know, if we, if we maintain that professional network, which is really still important to our community, how else can we put in place um, a structure that really brings the voices of our community communities of color to the table so they're leading those conversations? Fabulous. Thank you. Lauren, let's go to you. Um, so we know that when the city of Chicago put together the racial equity rapid response team, that broadband came up. So tell us, how were those priorities identified and what did they find? Yeah, so uh, Mayor Lightfoot uh, pulled together the task force as the racial inequity of the COVID's impact on the city became quite clear. And so this is a pretty great example of power sharing where there are community leaders, hospital and healthcare providers, and city leaders at the same table. And the community leaders identified in our first meeting sort of three priorities for their communities that were really hardest hit. One was around health and COVID testing and ensuring they had access to that. Second was access to food and third was internet. And I think that the fact that community leaders are prioritizing internet tells you um, sort of the extent of the importance of this um, in, in communities across the city. And so, you know, one of the things that it's, it's actually what led us on this sort of journey of uh, getting Chicago connected up and running. And one of the ways that we talk about equity in Chicago is that about how it's part of process as well as outcomes. And so um, I think there's a map showing like, I, I just think community partnership like leads you to have a more successful outcome. Um, so I think Sabrina, there's the graph showing our CBO um, impact. So, um, yep, cool. That's slightly blurry. Sorry, it's probably my bad copy pasting. But you can see sort of um, on the x-axis that's dates of signups. So these are, um, you can see over time we've seen exponential growth in the number of families signing up for Chicago Connected those rates increased when CBOs started calling. So when we actually were incorporating community leaders into the process, we saw better results for everyone. And I think that's sort of the biggest takeaway here and what the city and, and the mayor in particular are trying to do is the more access that you give people to data and the more they have access to internet to actually use that data to inform decision making, the more effective our outcomes are gonna be. We also have a COVID dashboard that I think will be um, either shown or, or put in the chat um, that was also an ask of community, sort of like how do we help um, sort of drive our own decision making. And they really wanted to know not just the citywide rate of COVID in um, the African American, Hispanic, et cetera, communities, but wanted to know by their zip code. And so we developed this uh, dashboard for them to use and community leaders use it weekly to drive their own sort of efforts in terms of direct community outreach. Um, obviously, they would not be able to do that if they did not have internet access themselves. Um, and so I think that like this marriage of open data and sharing that data in a transformative way paired with internet access is something how, that will really accelerate our progress as a city. That is fabulous. Thank you. Lauren, I understand a new hire um, is, is being discussed, is possibly in the works, uh, but you all have a budget gap like every city does right now, right? So how is this possible? Yeah, actually, I think he's part of the audience. Casey Baxley, we just hired him last week. We're super excited. Uh, and next year, hopefully he will be here. Ella and Chicago will be a trailblazer. <laughs> We've got a to-do list. That's awesome. Um, I love that a lot. <laughs> Um, and yeah, you know, we have a, a $1.2 billion gap as a city. Chicago's had some pretty irresponsible spending in the past, and uh, that's where our partnerships come back in, sort of to bring it full circle. 
Um, our funders have been um, really helpful and you know, would not, this would not be possible without them. And so from the beginning, when we were raising money for Chicago Connected, we purposely built in a position to help us build a strategic plan like Rebecca um, in Gibbons in Portland has and to help us think about how to do a community engagement uh, plan uh, with the whole city with in, for internet access uh, across the across the board. So um, super thankful to our um, funders for that. It would not be possible otherwise. Yeah, that is super exciting. And hopefully we see that in some more places also. Uh, we are getting some uh, questions in the chat from other local governments that want to talk to you all. So we should let everybody know NDIA is a community where folks talk to each other pretty regularly. So if we have folks who are joining us for this webinar, but aren't already in the community, uh, one of my staff will throw in the join link and we welcome you to join us. It's free uh, to engage in the conversation on the listserv. Uh, the trailblazers page that we already have posted uh with a link was provided for that there's also contact information for some of these amazing folks with us here today and additionally we have our friday afternoon calls all these ladies have been on the friday afternoon calls have been sharing uh, so that's another place to connect with folks in the chat one-on-one -on -one, uh, to make sure that you can keep up keep up with them ndia is of course always happy to continue you know to talk specifically to cities one-on-one -on -one. okay we're going to get to some questions we have a question from bert from connecticut wants to know how much if any support are you getting from your respective state governments and what is the nature of that support anybody interested in answering that candelaria you're up Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the things that has uh, come up, up that it's impacted us quite a bit is uh, the Texas Education Agency. So they've also received some CARES Act funds. Um, they had a Texas uh, operation connectivity. So basically they were doing matching funds. So if the school, it was basically a big bulk order program. So if the schools bought hotspots, uh, the state would help them pay 50%. So um, that was one aspect of the project that was kind of helping uh, on a local level for our school districts, that those that needed to quickly purchase hotspots or devices, the state was going to be able to help pay 50% if they applied. And they had to qualify. So I think they had to have um, high percentages of at-risk youth within their school districts. The other piece that they added um, that that caught us off guard is that then they said, oh, hey, by the way, like in August, go ask your city or county for CARES Act funds. And if they match it, we'll match that as well. So then we got a bunch of letters from all of our school districts asking us for money when the city had already uh, allocated all of its CARES Act funds. So that definitely threw us off for a loop. We're still actually working through that because we were able to pull and swap some funds around, uh, talking to our leadership and everything, because of course we want to help our school districts. They caught off guard with, they got caught off guard with COVID as well. Um, and distance learning and all of that stuff. Um, so we are going to support them with some funds and the county also stepped up to support them with some funds. Um, but yeah, it's added a lot of extra work for us to navigate that process and make sure that they have all the paperwork. But um, that has been kind of the, the level of, of support that we've that we've received so far to that focus of schools. And my perception is that that's pretty common. Or is there any, do any of you have anything that's different from education departments allocating CARES Act. That's, I think that's pretty much how it's been going. Although there's supposed to be new information coming out of the state of Illinois about digital equity, I believe next week. So I'll just leave you all hanging about that. <laughs> Rebecca Common, did you wanna uh, share anything? Sure, I did wanna mention that the state of California is in the process of developing a state broadband action plan so that's something that is new to the digital inclusion space. And this was um, initially brought forth through an executive order by Governor Gavin Newsom. So this is very exciting. And right now um, there are different organizations that are convening listening sessions and are asking for feedback from various community-based organizations, community members, stakeholders. So 
Um, I have participated in those listening sessions and have mentioned um, some of the great resources needed to advance the work that we're doing here at Long Beach and also in local government um, alone. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, once this plan has been developed and how it can support us at a local standpoint. But that's something that's very exciting. And I know um, other cities here in California are also going to be engaged in providing their input as well. Super, thank you. We have two questions in the chat about internet service providers. So let's talk about um, cities, and I know you all have like comms people who won't let you say everything you might want to say. So like, we'll keep this all very clean, uh, but the city's official relationships with internet service providers. I Lauren? Yeah, I can talk about, so for Chicago Connected, um, we actually have a fiscal agent, United Way, who has the formal contract with the uh, internet service providers, and we have three, so Comcast, RCN, and T-Mobile uh, for the hotspots uh, is the latter, and um, I think that uh, it's, you know, we, we've, we've had a pretty open relationship with all three of them in talking about sort of problems that are rising up. We've got sort of a, a lot of communication streams coming in from families, from CBOs, et cetera, of like common problems. And so we've been partnering particularly with Comcast who has the lion's share of our, um, our uh, services uh, to, to troubleshoot those. So my, my perception is that in the past where communities may have been shy to be as open about conversations and to have those clear conversations with internet service providers that is happening more now than previously because of the very public pressure to solve the problem. Rebecca Gibbons, can you jump in on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, the, a lot of the uh, ISPs have been participants and members of our digital inclusion network. So they've been at, at our table for a long time and they've been really great about coming to those conversations to share um, information and answer questions about the products and services they have. Um, but it doesn't really go beyond that um, in our community um, because of COVID and CARES Act funding and things like that, we have entered into a Comcast Internet Essential Sponsored Services Agreement. So we are providing that connectivity for some residents. Um, and we, we are definitely having more of those conversations with our wireless providers too now. And they are more direct conversations. Super. So in particular, one of the questions asked uh, had to do with ISPs involved in the strategic planning. So that is different, right, than having an ISP at the table to talk about solutions. But when you're creating the plan itself, what is an appropriate role for an ISP? Yeah, I can, you know, in the past, our conversations with our ISPs have really been um, related to their more formalized service agreements, their franchise agreements, um, and those conversations are happening at that level. I definitely see a trend and an interest to be having more, you know, cross-sectional conversations that link in our digital equity work and other benefits and community conversations. Um, we, similar to what San Antonio um, did, we recently wrapped up a broad communications technology ascertainment. Um, so we're using that data um, to have some of those for going forward conversations. Super, thank you. So switching just a little bit, there's a question uh, from Andrew about digital literacy services. So he's asking if local governments are providing the digital literacy services. I'd like to broaden the question, though, to those of you who partner with digital literacy providers, because you may not provide them. Maybe you fund them. Maybe you find other ways to support them. Rebecca Gibbons, I know you guys do some funding around that. Would you address that? Yeah, I mean, in the past, we've, um, through our Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, we have done some funding around um, digital equity projects, but it's been related to that funding stream, which is cable franchise related. Um, you know, we, we haven't done um, uh, as much funding for our community nonprofits that are doing digital literacy work at that, as we have and um, that we'd like to do. Um, but through the CARES Act funding that we have now, we're doing something similar of, of working with our community-based partners and providing them with operational support to 
be that liaison to deliver the services, the, the internet connectivity and the devices to residents and also doing that digital literacy training. Perfect. Lauren, can you jump in also on this digital literacy question? Yeah, so um, again, the city is not providing the digital literacy services in Chicago, but that's one of the core functions of the community-based organizations that we um, contract with and, and are paying. So, I mean, the beginning of the program was heavily focused on sign signing up, but it's transitioning, I think, now to really shifting to what are the digital literacy services that you're providing. And one of the sort of exciting things is that our CBOs all have different experience with digital literacy. Some have been doing it before COVID even existed. Some are somewhat new to it. And so one of the advantages of working with NDIA is, is being able to support all of those. Some of them are like off and running <laughs> and um, then some of them really need a, a little bit more training and, and want to learn how to support their work. I will say another sort of um, unanticipated benefit was that, uh, you know, these CBOs are not working on internet with K-12 in a vacuum. They work with lots of different members of the community. And so a lot of the sort of lessons that they're learning around digital literacy related to K-12 in Chicago Connected is also helping their, them with elderly clients and, and the unemployed and other groups of folks who are their clients. One of the things that Chicago Connected did was support NDIA's ability to um, update our startup manual. So the staff will put in a link to the digital inclusion startup manual. For those who are just getting started in all of this, uh, the section on digital literacy has been updated per the age of COVID. That's what Chicago asked us to do. So that's in there now. Uh, so figuring out how to do it as an organization, how to do it as a go government, right? It, it's really a matter of getting to the people who need the help. And that's why a lot of you'll, as you're hearing that these local governments partner with community-based organizations who already have relationships in those places. There's also a question in the chat about donating to digital inclusion efforts. Uh, in, so they're specifically asking about Texas. Candelara, you can respond, I'm not aware of any statewide fund in any state actually no right. there's rumors that there might be the creation of a digital okay. inclusion fund but whether that it actually is going to receive any dollars is still um to be determined so yeah i don't okay. um kind of on a statewide level uh, not that I know of. It tends to be more local, right? Yes. The mm -hmm. creation of funds tends to be local, and, and if there's a fund, then it is local. We are seeing that more with foundations developing a fund, that it's a community-wide kind of effort. The foundation develops a fund, they manage the fund, and then decision-making about how the funds are used is through community-wide efforts. Um, other questions that we have here. Um, the Digital Equity Atlas is uh, getting a lot of popular attention. Uh, so that and other tools, playbooks, suggestions for how to create something that on their own? Yeah, I mean, I think if anything, we really have tried um, to create items that can be tangible and reused. And I think the Office of Equity spent quite a bit of time uh, creating that map so that departments can make decisions um, in the way that they do their programming and the communities that they're serving. Um, so if anything, COVID has just kind of um, excelled the attention around the conversation and given us tools that we can easily go to without having to start from scratch. So, I mean, we're excited that, that we have an office. They just added a few more members to the team, which is great because it was it used to be an office of one. Um, so, and I believe now it's an office of like seven. Um, but yeah, the Equity Atlas maps, I think it just helps guide conversations and it's an easy thing that if you have a GIS team in your city departments, um, you can use that to overlay other data points and informations too. It's just a good uh, starting point. So we've definitely used that uh, a few times in our, in our projects. And in terms of mapping, so, you all have folks within the city who's doing your mapping. For those who don't have mapping experts, 
smaller local government or maybe you're not a local government and you just want to create some cool maps um, partnering with universities partnering with higher ed um, partnering with research institutions uh, or just finding folks who can figure out how to do it there's also um, a fabulous tool internet is infrastructure uh, which will put a link in the chat where folks can create a map themselves it takes no special skills because a fabulous volunteer bob balance just put the website together because he's a really good person so for those who need just to like get a map, that's a way to do it. I think we have one last question about lifelong learner engagement. Um, success stories about, let's see. I'm not exactly sure what the question is. Lifelong learner engagement. Does anyone want to? I I can talk a little bit. Um, we, that's not really what we had called it here. Our libraries did have a, um, a sort of digital navigator position. Um, I am not totally sure how it's evolving under COVID and they had done a lot of partnerships with um, some of our older adult uh, nonprofits and, and folks. We also have our, our housing authority, which has a lot of members who are seniors, um, have also a lot of work that they're doing there. I would say, I mean, we don't really have a strategic plan anyway around digital equity yet, but um, that isn't something that's necessarily been like folded into the, the overall plan yet in Chicago. Super, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, the, on, on our end, um, too, just on the same lines of lifelong learning, the library um, is providing a lot of that. Obviously, they're learning, too, how to do some of the services during a time of COVID, but they're phasing in, they're opening, um, they're allowing people to do uh, pickups. Um, so a lot of it is also a little bit of a learning curve on how you do it in a space um, to make sure that it's safe for both staff and customers to come in and, and use the services of the libraries. Um, but we have amazing organizations within San Antonio that have also learned how to provide some of the services. Not that we're meeting all the needs that we need to, because face-to-face -face you just can't beat that. Um, but there's definitely some evolution and innovation and in being able to offer um, some form of assistance in a virtual space. Super, thank you. We have just a little bit more time left. If anybody has additional questions, put those in the Q&A for us, please. Uh, last questions that I have, last question I have for our panelists is right now, there's a lot of pressure to figure this out, right? Um, this is uh, the um, kind of sad joke I tell is that I've never been so popular, but I'm kind of doing the same thing I was before. So. Um, the, there's this personal pressure we put on ourselves to work harder, work longer. We can help more people. How do you personally, how do you personally deal with that? Anyone up for answering that question? Okay, Candelaria. One day at a time. <laughs> One day at a time. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, um, we definitely have felt the pressure we've had. Um, we're definitely the cool kid on the block when it comes to um, digital inclusion and then the project. You know, everybody, of course, wants to get behind supporting kids and, and providing that support for um, distance learning and, and the homework app. But then, of course, there's all these other pieces, too, of, well, uh, there's all these other uh, groupings. Of course, at the end of the day, ideally, we would like everybody to have access to affordable broadband internet at their homes. Um, so a lot of it has been through conversation and kind of phasing in um, other entities that maybe are new to the space. And of course we get asked about a plan and strategy and how do you know that this money is gonna make a difference? And you know, if we're gonna donate, we wanna know that this is part of a legacy project, that it's gonna live on forever, that it's not just gonna die. Right. So some of it we can answer and kind of, um, let them know that this is definitely something that we're working for for long term and not just short term. Um, but I think it's just going to take time for us to to build the structure that will allow us to have kind of a, a, a good path moving forward that that will answer all of those questions that people want to have reassurance around. That is perfect. Thank you. Anyone else? The pressure question?
Okay, I won't pressure you to answer the pressure question. <laughs> uh, we actually have a fabulous comment in the chat, which I'm going to read because I appreciate it so much. Uh, Lee Williams says, I pray that you all don't feel like you're on an island and are getting the support you deserve. As a man, I know how some of us can behave, especially in the political realm. Sometimes we don't let the substantive support, we don't lend the substantive support we should. Cheers to all of you. Uh, I think Lee's sentiment is appreciated by all. And uh, I know NDIA appreciates you all because you all share your expertise within the community, which uh, those of us who benefit from are eternally grateful. So I thank you for your time today. And we did record this, so it will be posted to the website and I will let everybody uh, get back to their work. Thank you.